the titles come for me after the work is completed, like a baptism, not before. I was born in Buenos Aires, in Argentina, <clears throat> in 1929, with all the relatives that took refuge in my house, fleeing the persecution of the Jews in Europe. It became an environment that was very loud, crowded, noisy, I didn't understand the language they spoke. And I took refuge in a church, Catholic church. There was silence, nobody was there. And that was very meaningful to me. So I discovered that silence is a wonderful way to communicate. And one day, I got in the mail a book from a friend of mine from Paris. The title of the book was, The Dark is Light Enough. And it was a compelling title for me because I was working on a series of paintings. I was just nearly completing them. And I couldn't find a poetic translation in Spanish. So I went to the National Library. Borges was the director there. He did a beautiful translation in Spanish called La Oscuridad Tiene Su Luz. It's not a literal translation, it's a very poetic translation. The light is inherent in the, in the dark. And then many months went by, and then I had my exhibition of those paintings. So I asked him to come to the opening, and he said, no. And I said, why? <laughs> I said, you, I would like you to see my exhibition. He said, no, I cannot see, I'm blind. And there I realized that. In talking, I didn't notice it. He opened to me an extraordinary universe, and I felt I could step into that place. And I think this, the inspiration came from that, what kind of universe I can create with my art. To me, when I see something, say the world around me, art, or people, I realize that that's not all there is. There is something behind, something beyond. And then, because it's not obvious or visible, I feel inclined to explore it and discover what is there. For instance, I feel that in poetry, like in art, the source comes from a place which is silent and dark, before even language was articulated. I try to, com to communicate through a paradox, through metaphors. No one layer will cover completely the one which is under. So all that richness comes up to the surface. It's like an excavation of that space. Like I do, I do an excavation into the dark. That source that is present in my work, I feel like enacting the emergence from that source. And hopefully the viewer will also dig out, excavate what is there to bring it to his or her consciousness. But it's something that is really deep in our minds, because there are also layers in the mind. Call it the subconscious or the unconscious. And I love the richness of all of that. So I hope, but I don't know if I succeed, to go deep into something that's beyond what we can see, but that we can perceive. There is a difference between perceiving and seeing. My first studio when I moved to the U.S. was in Huntington, Long Island. I was painting, and then in a dream, it, actually a few dreams night after night for about a week, the paintings detached themselves from the walls 
and became freestanding on the floor of the studio. And they were transparent. It was mostly the transparency and what happened in the overlapping, how the, the visibility and the visibility came together. So in a way, when you contemplated a walk around, you didn't see so much the glass, you saw the transparency of the glass. How the material became immaterial. When I got divorced, I left Long Island and moved to New York City. And I was fortunate to have a loft in Tribeca. And I enjoyed very much the 80s in New York City. Um, I was part of the AIA very actively. When did you join AAA? Oh, in the 70s, very early on. I was very happy to be a member of that. I was very actively involved with that. It's a sense of community with my colleagues. Because those years in New York City were so, how do I describe, competitive. Artists did not really collaborate or help each other. And I realized I was part of that. I wanted everything. I wanted the best gallery, the best collector, the best art critic, the best of everything. And I became very, very unhappy. I, could, I was never satisfied with anything. Also, I wanted more and more. And at one point I said, I don't want to live like that. I have to stop it. I would like maybe to immerse myself in a very ancient culture. And maybe I can learn something from that. So I went to India. In the most exciting and extraordinary ancient ones, you cannot step into the temple directly. It was like a pilgrimage. There were many concentric walls around the temple itself. But once there, you couldn't access the most sacred part. That was this, what you call the Santum Santorium. Total, total darkness there. And then from there I went to Nepal, Kathmandu. And there the temples were not open, they were enclosures totally sealed, you can never even enter them. The name in the, in the Pali language was Chortons. Sacred objects were placed inside of them. And the devotees were walking around and around for hours. I could see in their faces how they connected to something they didn't know or they didn't see. Maybe art is an invitation to enter that world. That is a language that if we don't understand or explore, we cannot enter. Um, when I, those experiences in India and then the other countries I mentioned, even Egypt, stone became extremely meaningful. All the temples were stone. So when I came back to New York, one of the first things I did was to sell my place and move to the countryside. That liberated me from this competitive atmosphere I didn't want to be part of anymore. I don't interact with each stone. I just pile them up, creating a sort of um, emergence from the ground. Even the title for them, which is Pavavikas, which is a Pali word, it means constant stage of emergence. Because the stone or rock is the, is the core of the earth. The earth is stone or rock. And if you excavate just a little bit, it's rock and stone. I thought, what will happen if I do them at the edge of the river? There was a further element of revelation and concealment because of the interaction with the tides of the river. And for me, the big revelation came when I went back to India and I stayed in Varanasi. And every day I would go to the river, take out the mud, and then I improvised a studio doors, got paper from there, handmade paper, 
And there I began my first drawings with Matt. So when I came back, I continued that with the Hudson River, you know, the mud from there. And then eventually, talking with people about that, I discovered that when they encounter rivers in their travels, remember me and will dig it out, either bring it in person by, in their own hands or mail it to me as a package. Because all these materials are timeless. They come from ancient, ancient times, you know. And the accumulation is like a rested of the history. But in many ways, it's not a language as we know it. It's embedded in the mud, literally and metaphorically, there are all the stories. That's why when I do these drawings, I call it, it's an unwritten language. When I get those packages, I feel like I get an alphabet <laughs> with, wh with which to write the drawings. One of my favorite books, which is called Invisible Cities by Calvino, I did a whole project with that, uh, sculptures and drawings. But what I want to mention is that Marco Polo will go to different cities, you remember the story? To report to the Kublai Khan what he saw, because he couldn't go in person to see them one by one and then experience them personally. It reminded me that when I got the mud from those rivers, they were my Marco Polos, <laughs> bringing me, which I couldn't go and get on my own because they were in faraway places. Because in many ways, Marco Polo conveyed to the Kublai Khan that all those cities, they were not real cities. He imagined them. And if you describe them, you erase them because you destroy them in the process of wanting to explain and describe. Anyway, those were wonderful experiences. For instance, in Bali, there was no word for art because everybody was making art. It was a sacred, spiritual activity. Part of the art activity was um, a puppeteer using what was called shadow puppets. Me and my husband were the only people there sitting, no one was there, say midnight. So I, I went up to the puppeteer and I asked him for whom he was performing. And he said, oh, I perform for the gods. Which means it's not the actuality of what is real there. Even today, when people ask me, I have, I have the same answer because I don't make art for an audience in particular, or for a gallery, or for a reputation, or for fame, or for, you know. I do it for the gods, which means for the universe, for the world. I do it here, and I want to put it out in the world. So that was a an, an transformative experience to feel that way. 